Then perhaps we can begin. So, um, well, we, we have somebody here who actually needs no introduction to mathematicians. Uh, Sir Michael Tia is, a, is widely considered one of the greatest geometers of the 20, 20th and 21st century. He was president of the Royal Society and Master of Trinity College, and he was president of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. Okay, uh, is it, this better? Okay, he, he has been a member of the IAS International Board since its inception. He was also a visiting member from 2007 to 2010, and we were uh, quite sad when he resigned and didn't come for two years. <laughs> but we are very happy that he's back this year. Um, he has made fundamental contributions to many areas of mathematics, in particular, topology, geometry, and analysis, from his major contributions topological K-theory to his more recent work in quantum field theory, Sir Michael, Sir Michael has been influential in the development of many theoretical tools and has supplied far-reaching insights. Uh, of course, we all know he was a recipient of many honors, including the Fields Medal in 1966 and the Abel Prize in 2004. Uh, he was knighted by the Queen of England in 1983, and he was made a member of the Order of Merit in 1992. So let's welcome Sir Michael. Okay, so I think we're ready to go. <clears throat> um, this talk today is going to be uh, about uh, the mathematics and about uh, mainly about young people. Uh, so uh, listen carefully. <laughs> Even those of you who are not so young. Uh, so I'm, go I'm going to raise some questions and then try to just give some answers. So the first thing I'm going to point out is, of course, what you all know. Mathematics is a very ancient subject. Uh, and I'll say, I'll say a bit more about that later. Secondly, it's mainly created by the young. That's where the young people come in. And thirdly, it's cumulative. Every generation adds to what was there before and makes an enormous structure of what is mathematics at the present time. And so the, the questions I'm going to raise are really, how does this happen? How can we... Well, first of all, the antiquity of mathematics. Mathematics was well known to the Babylonians. Uh, if you look carefully, you will see a date there. Now, don't be misled. Uh, this is not me years before Christ. It means the Yale Babylonian collection. And this is the number of the collection. This, therefore, it's not 7,000 BC. It's only probably about 2,000 BC. Still, quite a long, quite an old one. Uh, and the interesting thing about this uh, tablet, so it gives, shows how sophisticated the mathematics was in those times. First of all, what they're giving here, if you understand the cuneiform system, is an approximation to the square root of 2. And it's an approximation to the square root of 2, which is accurate to sort of four or five decimal places. And moreover, it is written in de decimal notation. Now, people think, think the decimal system was invented perhaps by the Arabs, the Indians, the Chinese. But actually, the Babylonians had, had a system, except it wasn't based on 10, it was based on 60. So when they wanted to describe a number, they wrote it in powers of 1 over 60, 1 over 60 squared, and so on. So this, this is the first four uh, decimals in their notation, and it comes out approximately to this for the square root of 2. So mathematics is an old subject, and it was quite sophisticated many thousands of years ago. So it certainly qualifies in terms of antiquity. <clears throat> now into use. Here is a quotation of the famous British mathematician G.H. Hardy, who <coughs> lived in those dates there in the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. And he says, mathematics, more than any other art or science, is a young man's game. Cross out the word man, put person. And this was, in those days, they thought only in terms of men, mathematics, but I'm glad to see there are some women in the audience. So, 
uh, mathematics is a young person's game. And Hardy said that, and many other people said similar things. And I, I think <coughs> I'll try to explain to you more evidence for it. So here, for example, are two of the icons of youth for mathematicians. Uh, Every Scalois, Frenchman, who you see from his dates, died at the age of 21. Some of you here have probably passed that age already. <laughs> uh, but he, he, he died in a duel. Perhaps you don't go in for dueling. Uh, and here is Nils Henrik Abel, uh, who died at a comparatively late age of 27. Uh, he died of tuberculosis, so it was no, no duel. But these two between them are undoubtedly two of the um, young mathematicians who gave a tremendous new in- in- input into the development of mathematics in the early part of the 19th century. And now, to show you that if you're a genius and you create things when you're very young, you don't need to die immediately to be famous. <laughs> Isaac Newton lived to a ripe old age, you see, of 85 or something. Uh, and, uh, he, but in the year 1666, when he was a very young man, he had to leave Cambridge because of the plague. And in his hometown by himself, all by himself, he thought of a few good ideas like the theory of gravitation, the development of the calculus, how light is made, all within one year. The year that's called the Annus Mirabilis, Isaac Newton. And similarly, Einstein, uh, in 1905, when he was a young man, uh, working in a Swiss patent office, had a few bright ideas too. Uh, you know, any one of which would have got him the Nobel Prize. He had a few to spare. He was given one Nobel Prize. He should have had three. And all of that was done when he was very young. But you see, they didn't need to die. They went, they, probably their best work was done when they were very young. But they carried on to a significant age. So there's hope for you. You can be young, give good ideas, and then live to a ripe old age afterwards. Now, that's the, that's to show you that mathematics really uh, is given, I included here physics as well, uh, given a big push by young people. So the question is, given the antiquity of mathematics and the cumulative nature of mathematical knowledge and the fact that the young people are the ones who really produce the original ideas, how does it keep going? How does mathematics keep going? You think after all these thousands of years, all the new ideas of the past, it would be impossible for anybody to learn all that and add something to it. How do my young mathematicians cope with this vast amount of knowledge from the past and still turn out some new ideas? That's what I want to try to answer for you. It's a, it's a very fundamental question, because if you, if you couldn't go on, then the subject would come to a dead end, and we'd all be wasting our time. So that's the questions I want to try to answer. Now, first I'll give a sort of overview answer. The answer is to, <coughs> coming to two parts. There is an external answer and an internal answer. Externally, it, what I call the diversification of mathematics. New ideas keep coming into mathematics from the outside world, and they generate new problems, new theories, and so you advance by expanding your frontiers uh, as you interact with the outside world, and the outside world keeps changing. Then internally, if you even forget about the outside world, and you got, look at the mathematics you've got at any given time, it's a vast amount of information, what you have to do is to organize it. You have to organize it in such a way that it can be packaged and passed on to the next generation. Just a lot of facts in a lot of books aren't much help. You have to organize it. So the question is, how do you organize? You organize by unification. You bring together many different parts of mathematics, many theorems, into smaller, simpler packages, which can then be learned. These are the two key things, that you expand the content and you unify the subject. So let's start with diversification. Uh, Mathematics interacts with other fields. And I've listed here the subjects it interacted more or less in historical order. The first subject which uh, not only interacted with mathematics but gave birth to it probably was astronomy. People studied the motions of, of, of the heavens. Isaac Newton developed his theory of, of gravitation. And so astronomy was <coughs> the key uh, driver of mathematics in the early days. Um, <coughs> physics came along quite close with it, interacted with it. In the early days, the distinction between astronomy, physics, and mathematics is very difficult to to define. Then from there you go on to chemistry, advances in chemistry made more mathematics come from that side, then biology, economics, finance, and so on. So there's a whole range of different fields 
which have contributed to the development of mathematics by posing problems and sometimes giving ideas and concepts. And then there is what I might call new technology. As civilization developed, it got new tools. In the old days, you, you know, I mean, Archimedes was supposed to draw in the sand, you know, uh, marking it out with his finger. Uh, then they had discovered chalk and so on. And now we have, then we had telescopes, and microscopes, and computers, all these advances in technology, which come in, in directly out of the advances in all science, they, they provide you with uh, new opportunities to look further away. You can look at the moons, you can look at Jupiter, you can look at galaxies, or you can look at things with very small scale, atoms, <coughs> bacteria, and so on. <coughs> and, and then with computers, as you know now, we can handle all, all this information and the data at incredible speeds, and therefore we have powerful tools of a technological kind which assist, uh, I don't say they, they replace uh, the, the traditional ways of thinking and doing things, but they certainly assist you, greatly expand your scope. So this is the way you get new material for each generation uh, to get more things to work on. Now let me go to the internal argument, unification. First of all, the first unification in mathematics is abstraction. All mathematics are really built on abstraction. When you count numbers, four, five, and six, you know, if I'm counting people, I don't look at the individual people and distinguish their names and so on. I just count, and all people are identified, abstracted as one person. So concepts are very important, and abstraction is, develops new concepts, new principles, uh, how you organize them, uh, structure. All these are things which enable you to climb higher and higher up the hierarchy. Uh, abstraction is built on one level, they have algebra, then you can build on that to another. <coughs> well, arithmetic already is an abstraction, giving numbers to <coughs> um, collections of things. Then you get algebra, which gives abstract symbols for numbers, and so on with more complicated ideas. So abstraction enables you to put a lot of things together in the past in one package, which you label algebra, or whatever it may be. <coughs> and part of that process is what I would call intellectual technology. Not only do we have hardware, the, the microscopes and the telescopes, we also have the software. And I don't mean software with a, with a computer, but for example, calculus. The development of calculus you can think of as an intellectual technology. It's a, mach it's, it's a machine, not a hardware machine. It's a machine of ideas and techniques in the brain, which you can then apply to different complicated problems. And the development of intellectual technology, which is a nice word to use, is, is, is really one of the secrets of advancing. You get each generation inherits the intellectual technology of the preceding one, has more powerful tools, it can push the ideas further. So these are the, that's the benefit of abstraction. Then at the same time, you have to do pruning. Now, if anybody is a gardener here, then you know that to, you prune to encourage two things. You encourage growth. If you, you remove unnecessary clutter. You can see through the jungle. And it simplifies things... For, <coughs> um, for each generation. Pruning a bush makes it grow more and also removes unnecessary dead wood. So pruning is a way of slimming down the past to make it more productive for the future. And at the same time, abstraction helps to produce new principles which enable you to climb higher in the process going forward. So those are the sort of two principle, essential principles by which uh, it is possible for younger people to, to make contributions despite the large amount of information from the past. But now the next question I want to ask is, <clears throat> is this change in mathematics that's going on all the time, is it revolution or is it evolution? In other words, is mathematics still the same subject as, as it was in the past? We, 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 we call it mathematics, but if you change the content and keep adding to it and so on, maybe it's moved a long way from the past. Maybe it's not really the same thing. <clears throat> maybe. Secondly, does it keep jettisoning the past in order to make progress? Are we always throwing out things from our balloon, you know, to enable us to rise higher? Are we throwing away things that we kept in the past and we don't want anymore in order to be slim line? Or put it more ecologically, have we all the old trees been chopped down? Are we just, are we just growing, <clears throat> not cumulatively in a vertical sense, building one structure on the other one? Are we simply expanding horizontally by planting more and more plants in larger and larger areas. These are, so these are the kind of questions, and, the, and you can guess my answer to all these is, 
No, mathematics is still the same. It is, remains the same subject. We don't throw out the past. <coughs> we don't chop down all the old trees. We prune them. We prune. And so our, uh, the growth of mathematics is both vertical and horizontal. We expand its coverage, but we also build higher. And this, I think it's a, I'll try to justify that. The second half of my talk will be really more about the justification of this point of view. So I'm going to give you a point of view based on what I call historical continuity. The thing about an old subject is it has a big history. So you can look back on the past, see what it was that interested the Babylonians or the ancient Greeks, and ask what's happened to it. Is it, sim is it simply a piece of curiosity for the historians, for the scholars of old languages and so on, or is it still a vital part of current mathematics in some way? Has it been absorbed into our DNA? And I'm going to take three examples and follow them through and try to make the point that we do keep our history of mathematics remains in, in the sort of bloodstream. So I'll take three names, all of which are very familiar. They happen to be Greek, uh, Euclid, Plato, and Pythagoras. <clears throat> and in each case, I'm going to follow through some ideas that start with the Greeks and continue to the present time. And in the first column, over here, I've got the sort of the objects with which they started. These are the things that the Greeks studied. Euclid studied, amongst other things, angles of a triangle, and we'll talk about that in more detail later. Uh, uh, Plato, or Platonic solids, as they're called, described the famous regular solids in three-dimensional space, the cube, the tetrahedron, the icosahedron, and their duals. The icosahedron is the most beautiful of them, and so that was known to the Plato. It was probably known before. They're called Platonic solids, but there's no doubt they're long, long before Plato. So they've certainly been known a long time. These are geometrical objects, sorry. Uh, oh dear, what's happening here? There we are. Um, and Pythagoras. Um, Pythagoras is famous, of course, for Pythagoras' theorem, but actually, I'll say more about Pythagoras. He's famous for much more important reasons. But in particular, Pythagoras was struck by the musical notes, the fact that there's a mathematical basis to musical notes, the, the, the reason you have uh, ha harmony in octaves is to do with the math mathematical frequencies of the notes. And he realized that mathematics underpinned music. And that led to the notion of harmony. People talked about the harmony of the world, why it was that the, the world hung together in a coherent way. Fundamental reason was mathematical. Mathematics laid the foundations of it. And that was his Pythagoras' philosophy. And I'll say more about that later. So that's the, the, that's the first column. Then the, the second column uh, takes this further and follows through mathematical sophisticated consequences. Angles of a triangle lead on, as I'll show you shortly, to notions about curvature of surfaces. And then when you follow that even through to the modern time, you get into things like the general shape of surfaces, topology. From the Akira Eden, which is a beautiful symmetrical object, you led to the general notions of symmetry. And in the modern language, that's the theory of groups. This is the contribution, amongst others, of, uh, of Gawa. In Pythagoras' work, the musical notes in general leads to notions of harmony, and in mathematical terminology, leads to the notion of the spectrum of, of mathematical operators. So these are the sort of modern subjects which if you study, do a graduate course in mathematics, you, you come across. And they're still, they're the outgrowths of these classical ideas going back 2,000 years, and they're, they're very much present in these subjects here, you, 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 this isn't a, a fundamental examples of the ideas that followed. So let me start with non-Euclidean geometry. This is well, a well-known story. It's one of, the, one of the most famous stories in the history of mathematics. It has to do with whether Euclidean geometry was the only geometry that satisfied the sort of axioms that Euclid was interested in. And then it was discovered that there were other geometries which didn't satisfy the same one, uh, that is spherical geometry, which is the geometry of triangles on the sphere, which is actually the Earth we live on, or, or of the, uh, what's called hyperbolic geometry, which is counterpart of that uh, in, a, in a different direction. Now, the point is that if you take uh, triangles, then the fundamental theorem of Euclid, which says that the sum of the angles of a tri triangle is 180 degrees, or if you use modern language, it's... Uh, what's happened? The, oh, the arrow shouldn't be there. Uh, 
But sorry, that, that, that's a mistake. My son did the... <laughs> but he actually is a mathematician. He, wasn't, he didn't know the mathematics. He made a sort of uh, technical error. So there, there should, of course, be a pi here. Uh, some of the angles of a triangle is pi, or 180 degrees. Um, but if you go to areas of a triangle sphere, then you can easily see if you're, a, if you're an airline pilot and you fly in great circles, you know that you, the angles of a triangle uh, given by great circles uh, are, add up to more than pi. Uh, <coughs> in fact, there's a beautiful formula that tells you that the... Su- The sum of the angles of a triangle minus pi, again, I, the arrow to be pi, is equal to the area of the triangle divided by the square of the radius of the sphere which you're on. Very beautiful formula, uh, and showing you that in this case, the, when the radius goes to infinity, the sphere becomes flatter, flatter, and flatter, and you get back to the flat space case, and this is the more general case. In hyperbolic geometry, the formula is the other way around. The sum of the angles of the triangle is less than pi. And the same formula applies with the minus sign. This is a very beautiful formula originating with the early work of Euclidean geometry. But in this form, it goes on to have significance. This is comparatively recent in the development of mathematics. It's 1820s or thereabouts. And it had reproduced all the way until the present time and beyond. So very much alive. By the way, it's interesting that both the two examples I've given, non-Euclidean geometry um, and... uh, What was the other one? Got now. Uh, oh, the get the um, <coughs> well. I'm going to come to it actually. No, that's right. sorry. Uh, the, the work of, of, of Arbel and Galois, uh, and the work, the work of non euclidean John, are both about the same period, uh, early early 1820, about 1820s. <coughs> now, the geometry of Euclidean uh, triangles and spherical triangles leads on to the more general notion of what happens if you draw a triangle. Um, not on a surface like the sphere, which is uniformly curved everywhere, but imagine you take the sphere and put in all the bumps and valleys, you get a bu- so that's the curvature varies from place to place. <coughs> and so in this case, the formula of the areas of a triangle <coughs> gets replaced by a more f- general formula, which says the, the sum of the areas angles of a triangle minus, again, this famous pi, uh, is equal to the integral over this triangle of a certain function, uh, which varies from place to place, which measures the curvature, and it's called the Gauss curvature. So if on the sphere, the Gauss curvature is constant, but in general, the Gauss curvature will vary, and the average value of the curvature gives you the deviation from the Euclidean formula. Very beautiful formula. If you use that formula <coughs> and, and then divide up a sphere into lots of triangles, you can deduce the very f- famous formula of Euler, that the number of vertices minus the number of edges plus the number of faces <coughs> of uh, <coughs> spherical pop- polyhedron is equal to 2. Uh, and <clears throat> if you go work on this, not on the sphere, but on a more complicated surface, a surface with this shape, which we call a surface of genus G, where the G is the number of holes, then you get 2 minus 2G. Two this is now the beginning of topology. This formula is the beginning of topology. The genus of a surface is the first interesting example of a topological quantity. Uh, it doesn't depend on the exact kind of curvature. It's just the number of holes. Okay, so that's the so modern theory. <clears throat> now let me go back to the... Um, uh, where am I? A bit lost here. Yes. <clears throat> I think I'm talking now about... Uh, the second, second of the topics in my 3x3 three three matrix picture. Uh, the famous problem about insolubility equations. So besides the discovery of non-Euclidean geometry, the other big discovery of the same sort of period was to do with how to solve polynomial equations. And everybody knows how to solve, at least I hope everybody knows, how to solve a quadratic equation. And the quadratic equation uh, has been, solution has been known certainly to the Greeks and probably to the Babylonians in one form or another, even if they didn't write x and x squared and so on. They knew how to extract square roots and they knew... So this would have been known long ago. Uh, but it took many as hundreds of years before people found a similar formulae for equations of degree 3 and 4, cubic and quartic equations, but much harder. It was solved finally in the, about the 16th century in Italy, um, and then 
People tried to go beyond that to the equation of degree 5, and they couldn't do it, and they weren't sure whether they were just not smart enough until Arbel and Galois between them showed that it's impossible to get a formula for all equations of degree 5 or more. You, it's not, not that you're not smart enough, there is no formula. It's impossible to find a formula. Now, that's actually not any surprising result, but a, a, a sort of a philosophically interesting result, one that shows it's impossible to do something. Solving it is one thing. Showing it's impossible to find a solution of a certain form is one stage deeper, more abstract, and that's more typical of the kinds of things that happen in mathematics at the present time. This is the first time it happened. Uh, now, the, the, this idea behind this has to do with the... Uh, has to do with symmetry. Um, and you ask, well, what has symmetry got to do with solving equations? It has, because basically, when you take a quadratic equation, you have two, two roots according to which sign you take for the square root. And the, the two things are interchanged by just changing the sign. When you have three or four or five, you have symmetries of three things, of four things, of five things. It's permutations of the solution of an equation that give you an abstract notion of symmetry. And that is an abstract notion, but the same principle applies in the geometrical notion. So icosahedron is a beautiful object, which, as you see, rotating, uh, has a lot of symmetries. That means you can rotate it around. Every vertex goes into any other place. It looks the same. And uh, this has symmetries of a geometrical kind. And the symmetries of icosahedron are, in fact, essentially the same, abstractly, as the symmetries of a quintic, equation, quintic polynomial. And the fact that the icosahedron is such a beautifully complicated object is why the quintics can't be solved. Uh, and you want to understand the relationship between the quintic equation, five solutions of the equation, and an icosahedron. All you've got to do is to try to color an icosahedron with five different colors. Okay? And it can be done. And if you unpack the, if you cut the polyhedron that's open and flatten it out on the plane, you get a thing like this. And these are the five colors. If you glue it together, you can see they all match up nicely. Every vertex is of the five colors. And so the symmetries of, of the icosahedron give you symmetries of five things. And that's the connection between the quintic equation and the icosahedron through the abstract notion of symmetry. So that's easy to show you the power of abstraction. You can combine geometry and algebra into a single, with a single underlying idea. And so this is symmetry, and this I'm just saying here what, until just a moment ago, the number of the symmetries of the icosahedron is the, how many ways you can rotate it around so it comes back to the same position, and there are 60 of them. And if you ask how many ways there are, are permuting five things, five colors, there are 120, and half of those uh, are, correspond exactly to the 60 you get there. Uh, and this is all formalized in the language of abstract group theory. Now, besides finite symmetries, there are also symmetries which are continuous. The circle has, you can rotate it to any angle, and it remains the same the circle. So there, whereas a regular, for example, hexagon, you can rotate only through six different angles to reproduce itself. So there are finite symmetries, and there are also infinite symmetries, or continuous symmetries. Uh, the finite symmetries I've talked about to do with the polynomial equations, to do with the regular solids, but the continuous symmetries came to the fore in the work of Sophus Lee, Norwegian mathematician, end of the last century. <coughs> and he introduced, <coughs> he, he classified the different continuous symmetries, I needn't bother with the technical details, and he found some infinite families and then some exceptional ones. And the exceptional ones, although they're continuous symmetry groups, happen to be related in a very deep and beautiful way to the three um, regular solids. There are five regular solids, but they come, two of the, they come in dual pairs. So there's only three, really. The tetrahedron, the cube, and the icosahedron. And they happen to be labeled by le letters E6. They're called E6, E7, and E8. And this is actually, uh, this technology is a bit too fast for me. Um, uh, these things appear in modern physics. Uh, Lee was a uh, Norwegian, and he was very, I think, disappointed in life. He didn't think that people gave him enough attention to his work. Well, that happens to a lot of us. Uh, but he was probably right. Uh, they did pay attention, and as 
long after his death, they paid even more attention. And they come, they come into great prominence in, in modern physics as well. And these exceptional groups are, play, are now studied by physicists, you know, like they study their atoms. I mean, it's sort of basic uh, baby stuff for physicists these days, study these exceptional Lie groups. Um, as I mentioned, it down the bottom there. So uh, the, the continuous symmetries have played an important role all the way up to the present time and beyond. It's, it's current research that's going on in this area. And now, Felix Klein was a very famous German mathematician, very, very colorful. Well, I've got a colorful picture here. Uh, but he was colorful in other ways at all. He had a great personality. He was a brilliant lecturer. He, 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 he attracted a lot of students. Um, and what, what is one of his main contributions was to relate two of the things we've just been talking about. Non-Euclidean geometry, which had to do with hyperbolic geometry of angles not adding up to pi and so on, the work in my first column, to the geometry associated with Lie groups, which is the part coming from symmetry. So two of those three things I wrote down, one related to triangles and the other related to symmetries, actually were, are linked by ideas of Felix Klein. He, he brought geometry and symmetry together in the sense that the, um, the geometries that were studied by Euclid and others are really examples of s symmetric space, spaces which look the same as you move around. We live in a world which we think looks the same, more or less, at the basic level, wherever we are. You, that's why you can move. Otherwise, you, you find it hard to go. So Felix Klein, was his, he made this contribution which united two of the principles we talked about before. So these principles are not sort of independent things going off totally different directions. They link together. Now we go back to Pythagoras. Now, this is, of course, an uh, artistic impression of what Pythagoras looked like. Some people don't believe he even existed, but uh, his ideas existed, whether he invented them or somebody else did. Um, and here is a quotation by Bertrand Russell, <coughs> the famous mathematician and philosopher. And what he says was this. <coughs> Pythagoras was intellectually one of the most important men who ever lived. That's a pretty strong statement. Both when he was wise and when he was unwise. Now, that's a typical Bernard Russell sort of barb in the tail there. Uh, but let me explain what he meant. As I told you, that <clears throat> Pythagoras was very impressed by the way mathematics <coughs> seemed to underpin the universe. Firstly, in in connection with musical notes, they made they had a mathematical basis. And secondly, in connection with the Pythagoras theorem, which, although he didn't invent it, he knew about, which showed you the beautiful formula for calculating the diagonal of a right angle triangle. And that is a very important fact of life, underpins, still does, underpins the modern physics of the world. And so he said, he, from these two examples and perhaps a few others, he drew the fantastic conclusion that the universe is built on mathematical principles. And therefore, if you understand mathematics, we will understand how the world works. Uh, similar things were said later on by Galileo and others. But Pythagoras was, was the person who really first enunciated that, and he developed a school which became famous. And it was, it was the first time anybody had said that the world, the universe, is rational. It's, it isn't, uh, doesn't work by random events or random gods acting here and there. It's actually built on some fundamental principles, and the purpose of science is to discover those principles. So he was the originator, if you like, of the scientific ethos. says that if you ask the right questions and get the right answers, you will understand more. But because the universe, or however it was created by God or otherwise, is built on coherent, logical ground. It isn't, a, it isn't a, a random. It doesn't, doesn't play tricks on you. It follows its laws. And the fact that there are laws is Pythagoras' contribution. So you can see, if you're the first person to suggest that the universe is co coherent and rational, that puts your claim to be the most important person in history. And that's what Russell meant. What he meant by the other bit, when he was unwise, that's when he was wise. When he was unwise, is Pythagoras then had a sort of mystical streak in him, like many of them did. They went beyond that and had sort of mis added to mysticism, and in particular numbers were mystical. And so... That's when he thought he was being unwise. He was speculating uh, about mysticism, which had nothing to do with science. But that's just Bertrand Russell. <coughs> Harmony. Well, I, so I mentioned that Pythagoras was impressed with the 
way musical notes are based on numbers, and this is, therefore this is the what I've been explaining. And here what Einstein says, same for, uh, the most incomprehensible thing about the world is that it is comprehensible. Think about it. Why is the world comprehensible? Why does it behave with laws? Why are there laws? Why isn't the universe just a random collection of events? We don't know. That's, impo- that's really incomprehensible. We don't really know the origin of rationality, but we observe it, we believe in it, and that's Pythagoras' belief. So it's a, I, this is Einstein's comment on uh, Pythagoras' view, saying that you know, it's a really rather remarkable step forward for anybody to take the view that, it is actually com- that the world can be comprehended. By the way, Einstein is a great man for talks like this. You always get a nice picture of Einstein. He always looks like a you know, very learned, wise man. <laughs> and he, 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 had, he had a lot of famous remarks. To him. He, he was the ultimate soundbiter. I mean, he, he, because he became so famous, and the media were always after him, uh, giving him interviews, Professor Einstein, what do you think about this? What do you think about it? He got into the habit of being able to give very short, pungent answers which captured the essence of something and they could make a headline out of it in the papers. So uh, not many people have that skill. Uh, now, then I talk about vibrational models. Um, this is to do with the, the mathematics that carries on from harmony, from notes, musical notes. And here the nice... Uh, quote I like is the one at the top there, which is due to Mark Katz, uh, <coughs> originally Polish uh, physicist. I think, and he said, put in the form is, can you hear the shape of a drum? If you're out in the jungle and you hear the natives banging away on their dr- drums, well, you might want to run away, but think that they were cannibals. But if you sit to listen carefully long enough, can you work out from all the notes you hear what the shape of the drum is? Because uh, you probably know if you sh- t- change the shape of a drum, change the shape of the boundary, and so on, then it'll pre- vibrate in a different way. So, and if you know the shape, you can principle mathematically work out the vibrations. The question is, can, can you go conversely? If you hear the drum, listen carefully, can you then begin to work out? The, of course, it's an idealized picture, but that's the... And in the sense that the answers to that of keeping mathematicians and physicists busy for a very long time. Um, <clears throat> if, in the connection between classical mechanics and quantum mechanics... It was known to physicists that counting the number of states in the quantum system uh, or uh, vibrational states is related to things like the area in classical mechanics. Uh, and Hermann Weyl proved the first theorem of this kind and it's become a, a sort of m- main motif of a lot of mathematical work around this kind. How do you work out the vibrational frequencies of some system if you know the geometrical background? And here, Hermann Weyl... Uh, said he, he was also like Einstein. He was, he looked nice. He made good pictures, and he had nice quotes. And he was also he was even more uh, literary than uh, than Einstein. And one of his talks, he said this. I wanted to quote it. After talking about vibrations and so on, he says, "I feel that these informations about the proper oscillations of a membrane, valuable as they are, are still very incomplete. I have I have certain conjectures." what a complete analysis of their asymptotic behavior should be aim at. But since for more than 35 years I have made no effort to prove them, I think I had better keep them to myself. Well, not everybody is as self-restraining uh, as that. Um, and, and this is, I think, a, a remark. Because I, want to sh- I worked in this area myself, and I did something which uh, I think uh, Herman Weil would have liked and might even be the sort of thing he wanted to do. So he, I... <coughs> wrote uh, three series of papers together with my two colleagues, a very brilliant young Indian, Patodi, who died young, unfortunately, and my old friend is Singer, who's still alive. Um, and they were about, uh, you have a Riemannian geometry, sort of, think of it as a curved surface, and it vibrates, and it produces some spectrum, spectrum some notes, and you want to know what is the relationship between uh, the shape and the notes. But you can go beyond that. And we were interested in here in a question about... Um, the distinction between sort of left-handed and right-handed systems. Uh, if you go to the, down to the fundamental principles, you'll find some difference between due to change of orientation, something like that. And so we call that spectral asymmetry. The difference between the notes that have a left-handed origin and those that have a right-handed origin. And we developed a mathematical theory of that, a lot of geometrical applications. 
And, and, so, and in some sense, this could be taken to be an answer to the question that Herman Weyl said he would have studied if he had, you know, he had, if he hadn't been lazy for 35 years. Uh, and I, I thought I'd just list those here. And let me mention at the same time um, two of the Cambridge, I call them philosophers, because in those days, uh, mathematics was called natural philosophy, or physics, mathematics, was called natural philosophy, as opposed to moral philosophy. Uh, and when I took papers in applied mathematics, they were, well, I took papers in pure mathematics and then examinations in natural philosophy. So I'm a natural philosopher. It sounds better. Applied mathematician sounds rather like, you know, the guy who comes to mend your fuse or something. But natural philosopher sounds much grander. Um, and two people I mentioned here are my own supervisor, Bill Hodge, um, shown on the left, and Paul Dirac. Uh, they were two, when I was there, they were the two professors of mathematics in Cambridge. Um, and um, I have to admit that although my college in Cambridge is Trinity College, it's a very famous college, and which Isaac Newton went to and lots of physicists and famous Maxwell went to, it didn't, both Hodge and Dirac went to a rival college, and I, I've been honest enough to give you a picture of the St. John's College uh, over there. That's where they, they both went to this college next door. Uh, but now the point I'm mentioning this is a personal story, really. Uh, Hodge and Dirac, as well, certainly you can guess from Hodge's picture, Hodge was a very extrovert person. When I, you know, if you met him in the street, you wouldn't think he was a mathematician. <laughs> he looked like a prosperous grocer. In fact, he came from a family of prosperous grocers. He was the only exception to the family. Uh, Dirac, on the other hand, was a very different character. You, you could hear this picture doesn't show it, but when I knew him, he had long, I went to his lecture, he had long hair. He looked more like a famous artist or a musician or a, uh, you know, not at all, uh, uh, quite different from Hodge. Also, they're different in other ways. Uh, Hodge was very effusive, very happy to talk to everybody. Dirac was a man of very, very few words. He counted his words like gold. <laughs> there's very, and there's lots and lots of stories about Dirac. He was a source of many. The one story I do like, repeat, is the one he <coughs> went to dinner in, in his college, St. John's College, and what, sitting next to him was a young lady, and she said to him, Professor Dirac, I've taken a bet that you'll say at least three words to me. He turned to her and said, you lose. <laughs> <laughs> So you see, he was a man of, who spoke precisely. Anyway, the net result is, although Hodge and Dirac um, were colleagues, Cambridge Earth professors, both appointed very young, professors for 30 years, they didn't actually converse mathematically. Uh, from our present point of view, if you look back, Hodge worked on uh, Maxwell's equations and their counterparts in geometry. Dirac invented the Dirac equation. They're, from our pr present point of view, they're very closely related. They're fundamental in physics. Um, but Hodge and Dirac didn't talk about it at all. No, there's a, there are some mathematical reasons behind it, but the main reason I think is personal. Dirac didn't talk, so you know what will poor old Hodge do? Um, and and uh, this is very fortunate for me because I made my living really about, about filling the gap. You know what they would have talked about if they talked, and then they'd done done something jointly. Well, they didn't do it, and that left something for me to do. So I'm really very pleased that they didn't. You know solve the problem before I got arrived on the scene. So I, my life was devoted, really, to filling the gap between what Dirac would have said to Hodge if he talk, wanted to talk to him. Um, now let me go on to um, Fields Medalists. Uh, you, um, uh, the Fields Medal, as you heard, is a medal given to mathematicians who have to be under the age of 40. Okay? Anybody under the age of 40 is eligible. I just looked around this room, I'm sure there are many people under the age of 40 who still got a chance. Uh, and if you prove something really important before you're 40, you might get a Fields Medal. Um, and so this is an example of showing, and the Fields Medals are still given. Every, every year, uh, every four years, are they, the international congresses, they award up to four Fields Medals. So they're less than one a year. Um, and every, every time, these go to people who've done fundamentally new work pushing the frontiers forward, so it keeps happening. Uh, so this is, shows you the, the youth of the present time are able to make fundamental contributions to the progress of mathematics. And I picked out two, because they were the, they're the two youngest, actually. So you see, they're actually a good deal older than, than uh, Galwa, and, uh, older than even Arbel. So, but still, they're both tw they were, when they got their medals, 
they were both 28. And that's the record. If, you want, if you're under 28, you've got a chance of beating the record. Although you've got to, that's the date of the next International Congress. You've got to work out where that is every four years. It's a bit tricky. Um, and, and actually, somebody just, when I gave this talk somewhere else, somebody pointed out to me, actually, strictly speaking, Sayer was actually 27. He was 28 a week later. But it was, and Donaldson was a few months later. So the gap between Sayer and Donaldson was actually quite small. And I was at the International Congress in Berkeley in 1986 when Donaldson, who was my student, got his prize. And uh, Sayer and I, we, we took him out to dinner. We thought, he thought he should celebrate. And Sayer was co questioning very carefully, you know, what, what, when exactly was he born? You know? he, he was worried he might lose his record. He, he was very relieved to find there was a few gaps, a few months difference. <laughs> I remember that. It was entertaining. <laughs> uh, now, you don't get feels well just because you're young. You have to have some, done, done something. And so what did Sayer, Sayer just revolutionized two branches of mathematics? Not one. He could have, but like, like Einstein, who had three good ideas when he was in 1905, Sayer had. He revolutionized two branches of mathematics, algebraic topology and algebraic geometry. He started off by applying some new ideas uh, and topology came from outside. He, he, he only stayed in the field for about five years and he, he revolutionized it and left other people to finish the details. Then he moved into algebraic geometry and played foundations there for basically the fundamental way algebraic geometry has moved ever since. So in an incredibly short period of time, he made two mathematical revolutions. Donaldson uh, only revolutionized one field, but on the other hand, this field had a connection with mathematics and physics, so you might count, count double. Uh, and he revolutionized four-dimensional geometry using ideas from physics. And very broadly speaking, uh, what Hodge did, my supervisor, what he'd done was to generalize into ge geometry ideas coming from Maxwell, Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism. They led Hodge in the direction of the right kind of equations, the study of geometry, and led to a very important theory, now called Hodge's theory, which is the foundation of all modern geometry. Well, this is a theory which is linear because the equations, Maxwell's equations and Hodge's equations, are linear partial differential equations. But what Donaldson did was to go one step beyond that and to look at the equations which physicists now use to describe more complicated physical fundamentals, elementary particles, where these are what are called the Yang-Mills equations. Uh, C and Yang is, of course, well known here. Uh, and these are the, the nonlinear equations, which are the analog of Maxwell's equations. They basically replace scalars by matrices, and you get uh, non-commutativity coming in, and you get nonlinear equations. And Donaldson applied these nonlinear equations in geometry in much the same way that Hodge applied Maxwell's theory, and got out from that fantastic new results. So this is an application of nonlinear theory, and it produced fantastic results, which had not only revolutionized four-dimensional geometry, and by the way, four dimensions is the unique dimension in which this theory works. It happens to be the direction dimension of space-time, which is convenient for physics, and uh, the Donaldson's work is intimately related with physics and has fed back into physics, and a lot of work in the frontier, which mathematics and physics, dates from this period of time. Uh, Donaldson did this when he was a second-year graduate student, by the way, and he, having done that, he thought there wasn't enough for his PhD, so he went on and did something else as well. Um, so... Um, uh, to finish up, let me, let me try to become optimistic again. Um, I've tried to explain that young people are the source of most of the really original ideas in mathematics. Young, we, we can stretch it. Fields medal is stretched till 40. So anything under 40 counts as young. But you, you, it doesn't do a sub starting before that. Um, and the, the people still go on doing new things. The Fields medals show that there are constant new ideas being done successfully which determine mathematics of the future. And these ideas are uh, they're part of the long strand of mathematical history. They're not new things. They're all, they continue the subjects from the past through various evolutionary stages, generalizations, abstractions. It's all part of one large historical record. At the same time, it encompasses other fields, so parts of physics, cosmology, and so on, are absorbed or uni unified in this stream. So you want to think of mathematics as a long flowing river in that sense. And um, so I end up on a note of optimism that mathematics, there is hope for young, young people. If you're going to do mathematical research, good luck to you. That's what we hope that you will be successful. Otherwise, we, the, the mathematics will come to an end. 
Now, in, in Hermann Weil, uh, who was one of my mathematical heroes, uh, I only saw him once. That was the Amsterdam Congress 1954, where um, Sayre got his Fields Medal, and the other one went to Kodaira, a Japanese mathematician. And <clears throat> he, in giving these medals, he made his speech, uh, and he was a command, great commander of the English language. He spoke beautifully in English, although he was a German. And uh, he, he <clears throat> the, the, I quoted these two bits, I'll read to from his final speech. So having described their work, he summarized by saying to Quadaira, your work has more than one connection with what I tried to do in my younger days. But you've reached heights for which I never dreamt. Since you came to Princeton in 1949, it has been one of the greatest joys of my life to watch your mathematical development because it was a development following on from Hodge's theory and uh, the, the Blast operator, things that were closely related to what Herman Weyer liked. And then to Sayre, he says, I have no such close personal relation to you, Dr. Sayre. The things he was doing, algebraic topology and <coughs> well, algebraic geometry was close, but algebraic, quite a long way away. And your research, you no such close relation. But let me say, that never before have I witnessed such a brilliant ascension of a star in the mathematical sky as yours. And there was no question that he, he rocketed it up to fame. The mathematical community is proud of the work you have both done. And finally, he says, it shows that the old, gnarled tree of mathematics is still full of sap and life. That's, I love that phrase. It shows you, here's the old tree, <coughs> been there thousands of years, still growing, but it's still got enough inside it to produce new branches and new shoots. And he said it was such style. And I think that's the, the message I want to give you, that mathematics is an old subject uh, with a great deal of interest in the past, but which are all linked together in one continuous life cycle, and there's plenty left for young people to do, and we look forward to uh, what, your, what you will do, what will come out of mathematics in the future. Mathematics, I think, is a long way to go. Now, uh, I should end up on some kind of note, and I chose to end up on, with a cartoon. Uh, it's, it's a cartoon. Actually, the original cartoon appeared, I think, somewhere <coughs> either in Punch or the New York or something like that. I couldn't find it, but one of my colleagues who's quite good at cartoons, he produced this, uh, his version for me. And in the background to that, I should t tell you that... Uh, when, when people apply to do research these days, they have to apply to research councils with grants and fill in lots of forms. And you have to say, well, what did you prove? What theorems have you done so far? What are you going to... You, know, you, you're, you're sort of, you count the number of good theorems you've done and that sort of thing. So uh, in the light of that, I hope you'll appreciate the cartoon. <coughs> uh, it's meant to represent two cavemen. Uh, and a third caveman is, is, is pictured on the mantelpiece in that picture. And this one caveman is saying to the other one, I know he discovered fire. What's he done since? <laughs> well, one good idea is enough. Uh, so you don't need more than one. One good idea and you'll be famous. Thank you. Okay, I'm sure there'll be some questions. Uh, uh, questions? You don't need to give me questions, you give me answers too. <laughs> <laughs> or or you can disagree fundamentally. Yes. Okay. Uh, you showed two mathematicians who died young. Yeah. Uh, and then you said they don't have to die young. And you showed two physicists. Well, uh, <laughs> I, I claim uh, Patton Rice and Isaac Newton are going to the same college. <coughs> he was president of the Royal Society. And I, I claim that mathematicians claim Newton as a mathematician and a physicist. Well, in those days, you know, there was no real distinction in the early days. Gauss was a professor of, you know, his job was um, surveying. Uh, he did a lot of astronomical work. And he was probably famous in his time as an astronomer in some ways. Uh, no, I mean, uh, all the great figures of that period <coughs> assumed that mathematics and physics were one subject. So Newton was undoubtedly both a mathematician and a physicist. Now, on the other hand, Einstein definitely was not a mathematician. Uh, but he had more than enough physical insight that compensated. Uh, in fact, when Einstein developed his theory of general relativity, which is the theory of gravitation, he had, he had to call in one of his friends who knew the geometry 
who gave him lessons on how to do it, and between them, they, they worked it out. Einstein himself wouldn't have known how to do it. He had the insight, the physical insight, to know what he was looking for, and to go in the right direction. He didn't have the mathematical techniques it was necessary. Newton did. He made his own. He developed his calculus as, as necessary and so on. So, uh, but th th that's a long time ago. Things have moved on since then. It's much harder now. Uh, although there are some physicists, you know, both of us know, who are also mathematicians. <laughs> And uh, in fact, even get field medals. Uh, well, I, I made the list of, I said, mathematics interacted with other fields. I started off with uh, astronomy and physics and chemistry and biology. And all of these things influence mathematics. Uh, in various degrees. They bring in new problems, new ideas. Physics has the longest, and, and physics and astronomy I put, put together, has the longest and strongest link with mathematics, no question about it, and it still, still does at the moment. But it's still much... Um, and uh, you can't possibly be a physicist without knowing some advanced mathematics. I think it's possible to be a biologist without knowing much mathematics at all. An economist, you certainly don't need any mathematics. I mean, well, you may, may do, but you don't have. So in, in mathematics, it's more important in, in physics and astronomy than it is in the other fields, and vice versa. The influence backwards is less. Now, that may change. Now, another century or two, uh, the situation may change. and a lot of things happening in the biological world at the moment, and in the future, science may look, you know, physics is a small corner here, biology is a big, big thing over there, and mathematics is, is moves with the, you know, follows the big man and becomes part of biology. Uh, it, of course, has lots of links with biology. But at the moment, and for, well, at the moment, meaning for the last 2,000 years anyway, uh, physics has been the science with the closest um, links with mathematics and has fed both ways. Large amounts of mathematics have had their origins in physical questions, and that's still the case now. And a lot of mathematics has then found new applications in physics very, at a very deep level. Uh, as, as, we, as, as we are standing at the present, I think that's a fair statement. But you know, you, we can't predict what's going to happen either to the mathematics or to the science of the next few hundred years. I think mathematics will carry on, but what shape it'll take and exactly how it'll operate depends on the young people in the audience. Well, the Chinese have numbers on their side. <laughs> uh, I, I, I mean, what do you say is true? I mean, mathematicians evolve in a, in a cultural background. And, you know, if you... They depend on that. I mean, even if a genius has to grow in the right soil, if Isaac Newton had been born as a caveman, it's unlikely he would have discovered the theory of gravitation. Um, so, you... It, it, and and that's... Uh, this cultural background is, is, is you know, it's... It has a long history. You know, it's there, but not, you can't it suddenly bring it in and give a crash course and say, OK, folks, you're now a part of the historical... It, 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 it has a long history through the, both the actual development of the science and through the social circles and the mechanisms by which people are taught, the education. It, it's hard to disentangle the scientific research from the entire lifestyle, in a way. Uh, now... But on the other hand, as you can see from these different examples, there are many different cultures that produce a lot of brilliant mathematicians. It, 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 it isn't necessary to have it. There's no unique solution. There are many different ways. Uh, and they, but they tend to produce slightly different outcomes. I mean, the kinds of the examples you've given are of places which have had a tradition of producing um, creative, new, brilliant ideas in mathematics. But if you look at them and look at them carefully, you'll probably find some different flavor in the style of mathematicians that they produce. Um, the French tend to be rather more 
hard focused uh, and more technical quite often, with a few exceptions who are really outsiders, like René Tom or Gordon Deek. Or, um, the Russians have, have a rather strong school which in, co incorporates mathematics and physics rather closely together. And Britain they also has some much closer links between mathematics and physics, going back to Newton and Clark Maxwell and so on. Um, so different countries have different different um, solutions. Um, and you know, other countries are now joining the field. They, they come in later. So the Japanese have been there for quite a while. But they're not so well. It's only a century old, Japanese, and modern, modern mathematics. Uh, the Chinese are starting rather late again. Uh, but they have numbers on their side. And in 100 years' time, all the mathematicians will be Chinese, probably. Then. <laughs> they won't all come from Hong Kong, perhaps. But they <laughs> Uh, and it's a, it's a frightening thought. But uh, uh, on the other hand, I have to say that um, something that applies a little bit to the whole, I suppose, culture of the Far East, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, in China and Japan, there's a lot of um, respect for older people. This respect for older people goes along with, you know, not wanting to upset people, not, not wanting to be awkward, not wanting to make radical changes. So it discourages or doesn't encourage very radical thought because you think your teacher was, must be right. You have to respect him. Now, of course, that's not, doesn't, not cast iron, but there's an, whereas uh, other countries perhaps uh, don't have the same respect for what happened before and are prepared to upset them and, and do something different. So if you want to have really original ideas, you don't want to have too much respect for your elders. <laughs> I don't know if that's a good message to give the students here, but uh, I, I would say that always listen to what they say, but don't necessarily do what they tell you. <laughs> Doug, question so here. Uh, I'm a grad student in mathematics, and um, it seems that to get a PhD in mathematics is more and more difficult nowadays. Um, literally, it takes four years, 30 years ago. And now it's five years, sometimes six or seven years. <laughs> and, and people even say that you know, there are uh, over, uh, over 20,000 theorems proven every day on this planet. Uh, it's harder and harder for us to make progress and to make a choice what to study. And what do you think of that? Like, as a graduate student, how do we select our area? And well, you. you your, your question really is where I started this lecture. Something you know, on the face of it, it seems impossible. You know, all this stuff. I mean, how can young people? And then I tried to explain why, despite that, it does actually work. And I gave you the examples. I mean, Donaldson did his work when he's second year graduate student. He didn't. He didn't need three years for his PhD. Sarah, probably the same. So, uh, you, if you have a really good idea, you don't need to wait. And take one after another. So, actually, three years in Britain, people take only three years for their PhD normally. Uh, some will take longer. It depends where, how well prepared you are when you start. Uh, in the best places, people are doing writing a lot of papers before they write their, get their PhD. So it, and then the, it depends how you know, what kind of university you've gone to, what your background is, how much you want to learn. Um, but it does, I don't think it needs to take that much. But the question is, how do you make fundamental new contributions? And what I was indicating is that there is, there is scope. And the number of theorems is irrelevant. You know, I can turn a handle on a computer and generate 10,000 theorems tomorrow, but which of them are interesting? You know, I mean, uh, interesting theorem is something totally new, and brings new ideas, unifies lots of things. And the number of really interesting theorems that are published every year, one, two, you know, I mean, by some standards. Um, so the, 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 the most things that are published are you would call routine. They come by application of standard techniques to what's before. It's a good preparation for practicing finger scales on piano, but they're not fundamental breakthroughs. Those are much rarer, and they require a lot of thinking, originality. And there the young people have the advantage. If you're a young person, you don't have the prejudices. If you, if you know too much, you know that's the problem is difficult. Uh, if you don't know enough, you may, you, you may solve it before you know or realize it's difficult. <laughs> they used to be said that, that Littlewood, <coughs> famous collaborator of Hardy in Cambridge, that he always gave his new starting research students a problem, and without telling them that it was a call to the Riemann hypothesis. And after six months, if they didn't solve it, which they didn't, 
he would give them something easier. But he thought if they didn't know the Riemann hypothesis, they might solve it. If you told them this is the Riemann hypothesis, nobody has solved it for 300 years. You know, they, <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of it depends on psychology. And uh, <coughs> also the same thing was true with the young person. You mustn't go into a problem saying, oh, gosh, all the great men in the past have tried this problem and failed. How can I possibly solve it? No, that's not the right attitude. You want to start <coughs> going afresh and say, well, they didn't ask the right question. They thought the wrong way around. They didn't have the right breakfast or whatever it was. I mean, you, you, you've got to be positive. You've got to think of some new reason why you might be successful. Of course, <coughs> you, won't, you won't necessarily be successful just for that. But the, it's, it, uh, the world is... It's surprising that I explained how many young people do make new ideas. And uh, um, youth has the advantage to say that <coughs> you're young, fresh, you don't know so much, so you don't think that this is the standard way to go. You're looking for something different, and you don't know any better, so you have a new idea. Whereas if you know everything that's been tried before, or you just try the old stuff, you, you know, you're not going to succeed because it's been done before. So originality, which is very hard to define or to invent, is the source of you know, real creativity. And knowing too much, in fact, if, if you start off believing that <coughs> you can't do any mathematics until you've read all the literature, you'll never get there. You know, that's impossible. That, that accumulates, but that, that reading all the literature is not what you want to do. You just need to be selectively. You need to look at a bit, get some of the ideas, pieces. You, you, you skate around um, with in, imperfect information, and then you travel much faster. So it's easier said than done. I'm not saying it's easy, but I'm trying to, I'm trying to encourage uh, optimism and not, not uh, pessimism. Don't, if you go into the room thinking you will fail, you'll, you'll fail. But think of it the other way, and you might succeed. Oh, well, lady here first. Thank you. Um, uh, Professor Atia, you are talking about um, great mathematicians and great discoveries. So what do you think tells apart good mathematics from bad mathematics? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you know... Uh, Mathematics is, is both an art and a science. Um, and an art is, is, is you know, something beautiful. You, 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 how do you tell a good picture from a bad picture or a good piece of music from a bad picture? You know, you, you just know it when you see it. It's sort of instinctive. Beauty, you can recognize when you see it. very hard to define. So mathematics is, is, is partly an art. And, and what, uh, decides, what a mathematician decides to work on is he selects, because he or she selects, because... Uh, there's so much that you can do, what it, and you, you choose the things to work on which you, which you find appealing, you, which you like, them, where you think there's some beauty, some natural, natural uh, balance of ideas, uh, because you like it, and you, that's your choice. And every mathematician has his own taste, and taste is what determines what you what you do. And if you have good taste, you produce good, good pictures or good art or good mathematics. If you've got Poor taste, you produce routine stuff. So, it's, but then you know, turning it around, what determine what is taste? How do you decide? Uh, you only at the end of the day, if you've been successful, they say, ah, this guy chose the right problem. Um, so it, it, it's, but it is a question of there are no rules. Um, it does depend on individual taste background, and because of that, there's a lot of variety. And you know, we, mathematics lives on variety. You, you, you can't sort of even though people think mathematics is a kind of uniform subject where you just follow the rules, that's a mistake. The rules just grind you along along a given path, but which path do you take? That's much harder. And there's a, that's a question of you know, inspiration, guesswork, looking what you like for doing, all sorts of things. But it's very hard to, to give. Uh, the best advice to give is just do what you enjoy doing. If you enjoy doing some mathematics, then, then you're more likely to succeed because you will like it and you go on. If you do mathematics as though it's hard work and grinding away, you won't enjoy it and you won't get very far because it's sort of, you have no enthusiasm. You have to generate enthusiasm. And you only do that if you follow the things you enjoy doing. You, know, you do it because you can't resist the following that path. I say, that's think of it as like art. Uh, an artist paints because he wants to paint and he wants to paint this kind of painting and he doesn't care what anybody else does, he does his own way. And that way you get new art. I think there's somebody at the back there. 
Speak loudly, because I'm long. I have a question about mass mass. Yeah. Uh, you know, mass mass, uh, we have uh, seen in the presentation that uh, mass mass is a very old subject. Yeah. yeah. And we have a uh, foundation for over 4,000 years. Yeah. yeah. And and if uh, exploring new things in mathematics is like exploring a new world, we have to first get to our boundary and then we can explore new things. So which means uh, we have to take much time to uh, to absorb and know uh, the knowledge made by uh, the previous people. So uh, it, it, uh, as the development of mathematics, it will take longer and longer time. So uh, <laughs> like. Uh, in, in nowadays, it, it it seems that uh, it, it it would be very difficult for a young people to have enough time to uh, to go get enough knowledge so that he can make some uh, exploration. So I want to ask uh, why and how can those uh, mathemat uh, young mathematicians can make such a well? I think that was the content of my lecture. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> I answered. I think I answered all your questions in the last fifty minutes, but. Uh, <laughs> well, let me just summarize. I mean, the, you don't need to retrace all the steps of the past to get to the present line, because you leapfrog, you jump, you know, you stand on the shoulders of giants, you see where they were, and they take much bigger strides. So, although it isn't true that things take longer and longer, you get speeded up. The, the, the film movie moves faster in many ways. So, uh, uh, and the proof of that is that it happens. You look around and see that these. You don't, if you just believe that you've got to start with ancient Greeks and follow 2,000 years of mathematics to the present time, of course, you will get too slow. You have to be, uh, but we've, we've organized the past in such a way that with one wave of the hand, throwing group theory around or this around, we can condense 100 years into one hour. So, uh, no, I'm serious. I mean, mathematics has, has, has had the capacity to encapsulate the essential features of the past in smaller and smaller packages, which we give names to, theory of groups, topology, analysis. And these are uh, compressed forms of information. You know, if you know nowadays, we have this digital age where you can compress information. And information has been compressed. It's been compressed uh, partly by unifying ideas and absorbing them and generalizing them. And then with those much shorter facts, you know, I like to... I have a brother who's a lawyer. Uh, Anybody else? Any lawyers here? Well, <laughs> and we used to have arguments about uh, which of us could write better, uh, more accurate English language. And the, the lawyers, I claim that they would write a long sentence, never finish, went on, and on, on. And, and I said, look, man, we mathematicians have worked, because the lawyers, you see, they don't want to get to the end of the sentence, because they might be, have made a mistake, and then they'd be sued for that bit. <laughs> so the mathematicians convey vast amount of information, at least as much as the lawyers, but we've, first of all, taken the trouble to give a precise definition of one word. What does the word group mean? What does the word function mean? And then we have these shorthands, and now we can write one paragraph. And if you wrote it all out in detail, it would take as much as the lawyers. But we've got a very precise shorthand. And formula, our example, a formula, you know, E equals MC squared. It's a nice formula. It you know, packages a vast amount of information. So a compression of information is... is, is, is a, and then... The, well, mathematicians, I think, are particularly good at that. I tried to persuade my brother about that, and I once offered to translate legal jargon into mathematics, but uh, he's only partially convinced. Uh, thanks, and I, I talked to an idea. But, uh, actually, I, I think, uh, I mean, I mean um, or, or, although we, we can have this uh, short, short hand, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, but uh, the, in, in terms of its fundamental idea, it, it is accumulating. So that uh, so I uh, I also uh, experienced some something in when I'm reading some paper, and I find find that uh, currently when I'm reading uh, those paper uh, with with some uh, with fundamental idea and new idea, that that could be uh, that, that 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 must be something I could not understand because uh, all the new idea must be uh, very advanced and. It is uh, higher than some previous generation, but uh, uh, although there's some uh, all all the all the papers that I can understand is is some is those paper with like uh, just some calculation and with some not so important idea or just um, just uh, an old idea to apply to uh, some very minor aspect. So 
and and that's uh and so uh, what I I'm on the main is that. Uh, well, I think, I mean, uh, I, say I, I really answered this beforehand, but, and I tried to. Um, I think the, the, the you know, new ideas are, are difficult to define what they are. They're, they can't, can consist of a new point of view. You turn the problem upside down, like Arbel did with elliptic functions, he inverted the problem. Uh, you come in from, you make a connection with some totally different field elsewhere, which gives you some insights. So the new ideas can be very different forms and shapes, um, and they're, they're certainly not just building on the previous stuff by adding another equation. They're, that's something uh, jump, quantum jump. You 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 look at your problem. You can't. You need a new idea. A new, a new idea can it can come from the next room. You, you get the new idea by go, actually. I find a very good source of new ideas. You go to a lecture in mathematics, which is a very bad lecture. Then after a while, you stop following the lecture. And then you have spare time to think. And then you get some good ideas because you can't leave the room, you see. <laughs> and sometimes this starts by somebody gives a lecture and the result of the lecture sounds like an interesting theorem. But the proof that they give the lecture is terrible. You realize this is, can't be the right proof. So you spend the time trying to find the right proof for that theorem. That's very... And then occasionally you, you succeed. So uh, you can get stimulus from all sorts of directions, even from bad lectures. I don't recommend back lectures. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anything else? Yeah. Uh, so, sir, my part, yeah, I want to ask a question about, uh, I want to know your comments on the modern development of applied mathematics. Because uh, you can always hear some, some people doing applied math, they, they have complaints uh, that they are despised by pure mathematicians implicit, uh, though they, they express these things implicitly. So I really want to know uh, the, point of view, uh, the point of view of a pure mathematician. Well, first of all, I don't like this distinction between pure and applied mathematicians at all. I call myself a mathematician, okay, period. Um, uh, there's some that people say there is no such thing as uh, pure and applied mathematics, but it's simply different between... Uh, Mathematics has been applied. Mathematics may be applied in the future. Uh, all mathematics is, in principle, applicable uh, by one route or another one. Uh, it depends on the time you are and how close you are to the particular problem. Uh, so I, I don't make a distinction. And many uh, bits of applied... Well, physics is an applied mathematics. You like, all of physics is... <laughs> <laughs> uh, in fact, in, in Cambridge, the department is there. It's called the Department of Applied Mathematics and Theoretical Physics. So... The, the, the distinction between between theoretical physics and other forms of application is very arbitrary. Fluid mechanics and cosmology are a lot in common. I mean, there's a um, so. Uh, but of course, if you, if you talk about very humdrum stuff, if, you, if you, somebody's paying you a lot of money to give an answer to some problem, you know, that's its reward. You don't, don't expect to get an intellectual reward for doing that. Uh, if you're trying to develop a general theory that's going to cover the future. of Applied mathematics across a wide area, you, don't, you have to have new ideas, then you're doing very much like what pure mathematics would do. So there's a, there's a big spectrum of a uh, big arena which you can do applied mathematics or even any kind of science very close to the application. You know, you go to somebody, he said, I have a, this key doesn't work in this lock, but you can help me. I mean, that's applied mathematics, the mechanics. So the, some problems of applied are very close to the application, some are further removed because they're concerned with not just one particular lock, but Something which will be universal will apply to all rocks, you know. Uh, that's still applied mathematics in that sense. So, uh, um, there is, I suppose you might call it fundamental applied mathematics if you want it. I mean, there are, math, there are the basics of applied mathematics, the basics of fluid mechanics, the basics of mechanics. So, there are things which are, well, the basic probability. There are a lot of um, fundamental and questions which are not similar to pure mathematics within the and then they can be called pure mathematics or they can be called applied mathematics. So prob where probability theory fit in, it, 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 it covers a whole range of things. Analysis covers a vast range of things. So I don't, like, I don't think this distinction would be very helpful between applied and pure mathematics. It makes an artificial barrier. It's sometimes put in in you know, universities and departments to separate out some classes or examinations, but it, it's, a, it's a temporary notion and it shouldn't be taken as some kind of gospel. It's a sort of... Uh, Certain randomness, and it's a great mistake if people think there's a world of pure mathematics, a world of applied mathematics. 
they're quite disjoint. That's, that would be good, wrong idea altogether because there's a big overlap. And that overlap is probably where many things can happen. Yes? Okay. Uh, as an undergraduate I could say so far back that I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> But that's not true. I, I mean, I, you, your memory is quite good about some early things. Um, I think, uh, you know, I got interested in math. math I, I decided I wanted to specialize in mathematics quite early, at the age of about 16, I think. At the age of, up to the age of 15, I wanted to become a, do chemistry. I enjoyed doing, you know, experiments where you pour gas at the things in the explosion stage place. That was real fun. Uh, but then a year of advanced chemistry put me off chemistry because you have to memorize a large amount of information. In mathematics, it's easy. You just have to think of a few principles. You didn't remember anything. So it was much easier to do math. And I just enjoyed it more. So I just decided I was going to do mathematics. And I went to Cambridge. I went to first school to specialize in mathematics. I went to Cambridge to specialize in mathematics. At that stage, I was not very, not very interested in applied mathematics. We had to learn. Well, we had to learn Maxwell's equations. We had to do, and we had to learn basic, basics of fluid mechanics in the courses. But fairly early on, I specialized in the more pure mathematical side, geometry and uh, uh, algebra and so on. Um, I kept a little interest in theory of physics. I went to the Dirac's lectures, as I said. But only many years later, I got interested in, seriously interested in physics. So you can, move it, you can move into applied areas, and very many people do. David Mumford, for example, a famous algebraic geometer at Harvard, you know, after he got his Fields Medal in Mathematics, he moved into computer science. He'd been doing that for the last 20, 30 years. Uh, quite a few other people have interest moved. In, I haven't become a full-fledged physicist, but I've half. I've become half a full-fledged physicist. My friends think I've got keep bad company now you know, because I don't prove theorems. I just wave my hands in the air. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, people, cha people, many people change their interests in life. As they learn, and then, then they use their mathematical ideas in some new application, and so ideas can move with people, and that's really usually the best way to move them. You have a person who actually goes into another field and brings with him all these background and experience. A lot of famous uh, scientists and biologists started off as physicists. Francis Crick, for example, you know, they, people move from uh, classical physics into biology are, are quite common. Um, because the stage is ripe, it's a, a new field developing, and somebody's ideas can come in. So, uh, but my own experience was well, it, it all depends on your personality and you know, the people you're with. I was lucky, I, I had good teachers, I had a good environment. Uh, and then I went to Princeton, the Institute for Advanced Studies there, met a lot of young people, you know, and, and uh, got friendly with them, and they were all good guys. Well, usually your friends are the good guys. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I had a particularly good year. I made friends with places like Sarah and Hitchcock and Bolton. They were all there at the same time. So, yeah, you you have to have some bit of good luck to be in the right place at the right time. And I think I was I was fortunate because I was a graduate student just after the war when a lot of new ideas were taking place in France and uh, sheaf theory and so on. And I was just at the right time to learn these techniques and be involved. So, you know, you, 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 uh, many, much of life is, is good luck. And I had to good luck. But I think in China, you know all about good luck. There's some special phrases. Isn't it? You, 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 you make your, build your house facing the right way or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, let me make two announcements. Uh, first, tomorrow, there will be another talk by uh, uh, Sir Michael. He doesn't identify himself as a pure applied mathematician. He does identify himself as a geometer. Right. So tomorrow's talk is uh, a geometer's perspective. No, uh, I think it's something like, well, I, I think the title is something like Geometrical Models in Physics, or Matter, or something okay. like that, yes. Ge geometric Models of Matter. Okay. There's geometry and physics. And th then uh, the second announcement is, uh, you, you all know this is Congregation Week. And this, uh, Sir Michael is going to receive an honorary degree from the university. And that will be on Friday afternoon. So let's thank uh, Sir Michael. Thank you. Thank you.